Hello and welcome to this 40 Days Live event. This gathering is called Intersecting Identities, Intergenerational Asian Voices, and it features E.B., Hannah, Jenna, and Wingy. We will introduce our panel more fully in a moment, um, but first, just a few words of welcome. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, I'm one of the people who's coordinating the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. Let's go to the next slide, please. The 40 Days um, is part of a, um, this, this event is part of a broader program, the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, where there are daily written reflections, uh, there are books of the week, and several live events. Uh, this event, as all other events, are be is being recorded and will be available on YouTube for those who would like to see it afterwards. Next slide, please. This is the final week for written for new daily written reflections for the 40 days. Um, these are the featured writers for this week. Um, this event is part of that as well. And there's also a featured book. So if you can go to the next slide, please. The featured book is called Jesus and the Marginalized. Um, and it's uh, Jesus Christ for Koreans in the United Church of Canada. It's a, um, a great book. Um, that's available from the United Church Bookstore, and it's possible to order this book and many others. Um, and if you enter the discount code 40 days, you'd receive a discount of 20% uh, off this book. So it's a great resource to pick up. Um, let's go to the last slide, please. So uh, all this information and more is available on the website for the 40 days of engagement and anti-racism, and um, some additional resources are there as well. So hope that you will continue to find ways to engage in this program as a whole uh, on this day and other days. With that, I will um, turn it over to Jenna, who is moderating uh, this evening's event um, and who will guide us through the rest of the evening. So over to you, Jenna, and thank you. Thank you, Adele. Yeah, so hello and welcome everyone. Um, as Adele mentioned, my name is Jenna Yango Leonard and I'm gonna be moderating this evening's panel um, so before we get started, if any of you feel led, why don't we all just uh, put into the chat box where we're all calling in from. So I'm calling in from Uxbridge. Um, so for those of you who aren't from Southern Ontario, it's just about an hour north of Toronto there. So still in that kind of a central <laughs> space. Um, and yeah, so as Adela mentioned, uh, tonight we're going to be discussing the topic of intersecting identities. Um, with the focus on intergenerational Asian voices. And I'm uh, so pleased and uh, so fortunate to be able to present here today along with our panelists here, Wingy, Hannah, and Evie. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about their experiences and more about their um, wisdoms that they have to share with us about how our intersecting identities and how we have been able to interact with this topic here tonight. Um, so before we get started, I just want to give you a little bit of a roadmap to what we're going to be uh, doing this evening so you know what to expect and where we're going to be going. So we're going to be heading into some quick introductions from our panel shortly. But first, I want to just touch base with you all on what we mean when we're talking about intersecting identities. So I'm sure that most of you are already well aware of what an intersecting identity is and what intersecting means and all of those different pieces and how those pieces can play out in our own lives. But to make sure that we're all on the same page, I just wanna to touch base on the perspective we're coming from tonight. So what does it mean to have intersecting identities? So the first piece of uh, that, the first, Place we're coming from is the idea that our identities consist of multiple and intersecting factors. Um, so, you know, those things happen. So when we're talking about race or ethnicity or gender or sexual identity or uh, gender expression or age, there are many different factors that intersect together to help us um, kind of create this piece of life that we call identity. And so that's where we see what those factors include. And our identities aren't static and they change and develop over time. Um, so one good example of that is age. So no matter how hard we try to stay the same age, 
uh, we will always get one year older and one year older and one year older. So identities don't stay the same. They're not static. They move and develop just as we move and develop. Um, looking at other ways that they develop is uh, sometimes we have external factors that change what our identities are. So I don't know if any of you know Trevor Noah, but he's a comedian. And in one of his stand-up specials, um, coming from South Africa, uh, being mixed race, he talks about being considered mixed race in South Africa. But then when he emigrated to the United States, all of a sudden, his racial identity was no longer mixed race, but became Black. So sometimes there are external forces that you know try to dictate our identity pieces for us. So that you know can create some struggle and uh, intersection as well. Um, and then there are just pieces that intersect. So the way that those intersections work and the way that they come to be, even if we can be so similar on paper to everyone, to other people around us, the way that those intersections come and inter come across each other, that's how we create these unique uh, experiences and these unique ways of seeing the world. So a good example of that is for any of you who have siblings. So I have two brothers and my brothers. Uh, so my older brother and I we were both born in Japan. We both have uh, uh, interracial parents. We both uh, grew up in Scarborough and went to school overseas and had all these similar experiences. But because of the ways our identities have come together, even though on paper, so much of our lived experience is the same, those pieces of identity and the way that they um, come together really create these unique uh, experiences for us. Okay, so with kind of this basis of understanding, I'm gonna uh, hand it over to our panelists now to give introductions of themselves. And we're gonna start now with Wing Ye. Thank you, Gina. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Wing Yi Wong. You can call me Wing or Wing Yi. That is my Chinese name. Wing means singing. Yi means a present in the ancient Chinese. So the meaning of my name could be praising the gift of God. Before I came to study abroad, I worked as a full-time minister in Hong Kong. After finishing my Master of Theology in preaching in the U.S., I embarked on my doctoral journey in Toronto. Currently, I am a PhD candidate in homiletics at Emmanuel College, University of Toronto. I am now a member of College Street United Church, serving as both a preacher and a um, children minister. I also regularly do supply preaching at various United Churches, including trilingual Asian diaspora communities. Thank you for having me today. I'm excited to share and learn from all of you this evening. Okay, thank you, Wing Yi. Hannah, can we uh, get some, let's hear from you next. Thank you, Jenna. Um, my name is Hannah Kim Craig. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am a racialized settler on Turtle Island, and I hold both Korean and white Canadian heritage. Um, I grew up in the church, and I'm often known by association through my parents, uh, David and Haran Kim Craig, uh, who are very active in, in the United Church. Um, but as for myself, I was always a member of uh, First Grosvenor Park United Church in Saskatoon, um, and now help uh, my dad at Richmond Hill, uh, St. Matthew's United Church, uh, in uh, music worship. Uh, but in terms of anti-racism and racial justice work, I began as uh, um, uh, in the youth team in 2021, um, working with the United Church uh, office um, and helping to engage young people in uh, anti-racism work within the church. Um, and I'm very excited to be here, and I thank everyone for, for coming today. Thank you, Hannah. E.B.? Hi, thanks, Jenna. Hi, my name is E.B., and uh, you see my last name is Chen, and, uh, and I'm the uh, Taiwan indigenous, which is belong to a tribe called Bunun. So if you know Taiwan, and uh, we live in the central the mountains. So, and you can Google uh, my tribe. My full name is E.B. Sokuman Tanapima Takbanwat Bunun. There's no last name in it, so 
don't bother it. Just call me Evie. So um, I'm now uh, serving in the Cranbrook United Church in uh, East Kootenai in British Columbia. So uh, serving in the main uh, white dominant uh, church. So uh, this is a really uh, good uh, place for me. And I've been serving here for seven years. And I've been part of the United Church for over, over seven seven years. So uh, I'm also part of the uh, there is some common table members. And uh, thank you for having me and good to see everyone tonight. Thank you. So as for me, as I mentioned, my name is Jenna and I grew up uh, being a mixed kid. Um, though as I get ready to celebrate uh, my 35th birthday in a couple of weeks, I'm realizing that I've long outgrown that kid moniker. Um, so again, identity, not static. Um, so the mixed part comes from my dad uh, being of Ilocano descent from the Philippines and my mom being of Anglo heritage, a settler from no Sydney, Nova Scotia. I was born in Japan, though I have no claim whatsoever to being a Japanese unless you uh, consider appreciation for their food culture. Most of my life I've spent in Southern Ontario, though I did have the great um, pleasure and fortune to be able to spend seven years living in the Philippines during my uh, adolescent and teen years. Um, though even that portion I spent predominantly at an American evangelical school, so you know, the, again, those different pieces that inform you. Um, currently, I am serving at the United Church of Canada Foundation as the foundation coordinator. So uh, that's working with all of our uh, wonderful communities of faith and other organizations that might be hoping to get some grants through our Seeds of Hope program, but then also um, working with our great team to uh, work on our for priority areas of which one is anti-racism. So it's been a joy to be able to um, be part of that team here at the foundation. So thank you, uh, Evie, Hannah, and me for sharing and for introducing us uh, to you guys. So we're gonna get started with our questions now. And I'm just gonna share my screen again so we can all look at that uh, first question together. So. The first place that we're going to start talking about is to consider the question, as we continue to discuss and define intersecting identities, how would you each define or describe how intersecting identities have impacted your life, um, considering your perspective as an Asian person? And a bonus, no problem if you can, but if you are able to, if you could give an example of how that intersecting identity has impacted your life within the United Church, that would be fantastic as well. Um, and why don't we start with uh, Evie this time? Right. Thank you, Jenna. So as um, Jenna mentioned earlier a little bit about uh, this, uh, this topic, I think that's uh, the uh, Learning intersecting identities, it's uh, for many people have a uh, very similar experience, but for some people, they have quite, uh, quite uh, sort of like uh, unexpected experience because it is an ongoing conversation for persons who are experiencing uh, having the intersecting identity, like moving to different places or learning a different, because you're not only recognizing the different, but also embracing them. So it sounds like very uh, abstract, but this is actually very uh, important for people when uh, when people are learning uh, what does it mean intersecting identities, which is uh, for my experience, I've lived in Canada for uh, almost 18 years and doing my uh, master degree and also doctor degree and then coming to our church who are uh, largely uh, white, white people in the, in the congregations. And uh, my background is unique because I'm from the uh, indigenous uh, group and coming to a different uh, community and country. So I don't know if you can sense my uh, my feeling is coming to a different places and do, doing a different work. It's kind of a separation from familiar because without a people immigrating to other country like coming to Canada, they can have a new life. They can have a new things, right? But First thing is they have to experience they are separating from those things that they have familiar. 
they're separating from their friends, life, the job they used to do, a lot of things that use like lifestyle. And they may experience the re, uh, resistance in living in the current uh, lifestyle. So they come into, they have to come to a point that uh, uh, in my cases, all of the years, people see me really enjoying life in Canada. This is true. Indeed, I really like Canada. But Every once in a while, I have to make adjustment in order to to tell me what should I do next, and what am I trying to do right now? Because you always have something to put your back. Oh, you're from Taiwan. You're from your tribe, and there's something that you can never forget, and a different uh, and habit and different lifestyle. So, being an intersecting identities uh, person. The impact, not only those, because you must consciously decide how you will live and what kind of person you will become now or in the future. But for some people, most of the people who are raised or born in Canada, you probably have similar, you know, similar experience. But that this kind of experience that I just described, it's happened uh, very often. I mean, from my own experience and. You have to tell yourself what kind of personality and spiritual spirituality you will bring into the group, into your community, into the people that you live in. For me, to the church that you are, you are serving, and how alive you intend to be. And as you can see, I'm trying to do very positively in this intersecting identities, but a lot of time people have many challenges and difficulties to do this. But uh, I have intend to uh, do, do this practice again and again because why? I have three children. They always ask me question. How did you do that? Because people always misunderstood. I'm Japanese. I'm uh, Filipinos or something. Other people, and I just tell them that you just have to uh, learn to understand that people have different uh, experience and different background and opinion. But important is. You must consistently decide and to learn know it, learn it, um, how how you will live your life and what kind of person you will become. I mean, this is a very easy to understand, but a lot of time when if people can really learn this kind of inner conversations to themselves, and this is very uh, sometimes it's it's really beneficial because uh, the one can be. Uh, very helpful to others. Like for for myself, I help my kids to understand why people wanted to say that. Oh, you have a darker skin, and my kids will say they're so funny because we speak English. We we sort of like born and raised here, but people still see us as the uh, outsider. But that is the uh, their case, and so we just have to uh, spend time to talk about it. We just have to uh, try to not distract it by those because. Uh, they may have not yet learned the diff uh, different uh, cultural perspective or different identities that other people have. So, um, but for me, uh, how does this impact? I just share that this, this is uh, actually been an ongoing practice, and uh, a lot of the uh, adjustment you make in every every once in a while. But uh, but I realized that when I my background is was the uh, Presbyterian Church back in Taiwan, but when I come to Canada, join the United Church, I realized the um, United Church have given a really broadened view on this uh, intersecting identity, because not only in Canada people can experience the uh, races, but in back in Taiwan or other country, you might have something similar happen. But in United Church. United Church people, I'm not saying that everyone is anti-racism, but they do have something happen as well. But I'm saying that in the United Church, it's very friendly. People are trying their best to make an effort to create a better environment and make a better, a better world for everyone. And I have learned and uh, beneficial from this. And that's why I, I love our church and not United Church. So, uh, I mean, this is uh, giving me a lot of the... Uh, uh, new uh, perspective because having the intersecting identities and actually can bring a lot of possibility but i will just stop sharing from here so we can hear others thank, thank you, you.
That's great. And I, I take to heart your um, mention of just how you have to always be conscious and make those constant adjustments. Um, it's never just life as is. There's always a constant movement. Thank you. Um, Hannah, can we uh, move to, to you next? Thank you. Thank you, Jenna, and thank you, Evie. Um, when I was thinking of this question, one of the main themes, and this is more on the challenges, um, I guess, of intersecting identities, one of the the words that came to mind was invalidation. So on various levels growing up, I was taught implicitly and in in various spaces to invalidate or minimize my experiences with racism. And part of that, um, I think, had to do with how I did not see myself as a person of color for a very long time growing up uh, because biracial was no different than being white. And on top of that, um, I, I didn't have as much of a connection being born in Canada uh, and not having as much time in, in Korea to really explore or own the Asian side of my identity, my Korean side. Um, but even then, I struggled with the common experiences of the Asian diaspora in Canada with stereotypes of a model minority, where we don't talk about our problems to kind of put our head down and work. And so on top of that layer of not really feeling that I could validate my racialized identity, I couldn't really, ha I still struggled with the racism that that existed um, in in all the, the spaces that I was in, in, in school um, and through the media. Uh, and on top of that, being a girl growing up um, and taught to be understanding before being heard. Uh, and so all of this insecurity with being biracial and, and having these anti-Asian racist stereotypes um, and this gendered aspect to it that kind of taught me to be more silent and to listen um, and to not really have these thoughts on my own, um, even though I did and and I was thinking yeah. about it, but not sure how to, to really navigate oh. that. Um, and then in church spaces, I think kind of touching on, on being growing up in UCC and being a younger person in church spaces, it was natural for me to be a listener. Um, and even though there were opportunities to engage in the service and to participate, um, they were very, they were very selective. Uh, and one big thing I think about being in church spaces for myself was not having a role model uh, with similar experiences to me to talk about these feelings or to to stop and consider how racism impacted me on a systemic level. Because um, much of the education that when I was growing up was on the individual racism um, and how people have a personal responsibility to be kind to others and to be accepting. Um, so even now in church spaces and in, in spaces where there's decision making, I do still struggle with validating myself to propose ideas with confidence. And I've obviously grown a lot that I can in own um, what I denied myself for such a long time of, of being a person of color. Um, but I think touching kind of on Evie's point as well to, to end my my piece, uh, this idea of fluidity and, and refinding how I end identify and present myself in both Korean Christian spaces in predominantly white Christian spaces in how I'm growing and now more of a mentor to some uh, than the the younger uh, person in the in the in the space. So uh, and also as a Christian and what that means for myself. Well, that's great, Hannah. I take your point of that feeling of being invalidated, especially uh, with those identities of Asian and you know the the stereotype about the passive Asian as well as this passive woman. So uh, I really take to heart those uh, the comments you have. Winnie, if we can move on to uh, your, your reflection here. Wow, thank you for the sharing. Um, so um, yeah, when I think of this question, I agree that what Gina shared with us at the very beginning, that intersecting identities refer to the multiple dimensions of a person's social identity that intersect and interact with one another, shaping our worldviews and experiences. 
And I would like to bring in the concept of in-betweenness to help us reflect on our intersecting identities. Homi Baba, a post-colonial scholar, refers to the concept of in-between space as a site of cultural hybridity and negotiation, where different identities and cultures intersect and interact. Generally speaking, the in-between space is a place of ambiguity where dominant and subordinate cultures clash, but also where new forms of cultural express, expression and resistance can emerge. Let me share my personal experience of in-betweenness as an example to illustrate how it has shaped my understanding of intersecting identities. Coming from a metropolitan city where my culture is dominant in the place, I only became aware of my subordinate status until I went to study abroad in North America. Suddenly, I found myself categorized as an Asian woman, a term I seldom thought of before. This clash between my subordinate culture and the dominant white culture in North America made me realize that I was being racialized meaning that I was seen as a non-white person on this land. My skin color, accent, and appearance influenced how people perceived me. I became a racialized person, navigating myself in a strange world, wondering where I truly fit in and feeling like I am living in an in-between space. However, this in-between experience has also created a new chance for me to deeply reflect on my intersecting identities. Having migrated from Hong Kong to the United States and then to Canada in recent years, I've come to realize that hybridity is the true accent when it comes to one's identity. I am a Hong Konger from a traditional Chinese family. I am an international student and new immigrant in Canada. I teach people how to speak better in a language that is unfamiliar to me in my preaching class. I am also an Asian woman attending an English speaking church as a regular member and supply preacher. The experience of living in between spaces and cultures reflects the complexity, diversity and beauty of ourselves and our world. It shows that both we and the world are not simply black or white, English or Chinese, but we are non-binary, hybrid. And these are many intersections where new conversations and possibilities often emerge from these in-between spaces. And I believe that God is present in all these in-between spaces. My hybridity has allowed me to experience God's love, helping me navigate myself in this world and enabling genuine conversations with many people. Thank you, Ling Yi. I really love what you're talking about with that um, in-betweenness. Um, growing up, I was always, uh, we called that liminal space. Um, so this idea of you're not here and you're not there. And like I mentioned, I grew up a little bit in the Philippines um, and I attended uh, missionary kids schools. And so there's this idea with the white American missionaries around me that uh, they were neither here nor there either, right? So they're not like they're white American parents who were born and bred American and chose to come to the Philippines, but neither were they uh, Filipinos that were uh, born in the Philippines. But there was a big piece that they also didn't see because they would pair me into that group of, oh, you're just like us, Jenna. And the language and the disparaging comments I would hear about what they would call the nationals and how stupid the nationals are. Oh, nationals can never be really beautiful and they don't really know what's going on. And this uh, disparaging commentary that I would just hear all the time, but because they consider me to be in this liminal space with them, uh, being not neither here nor there, uh, when I would speak up and say, you know, those nationals that you're talking about are my family. Those are my aunts and my uncles. That's my father, my grandmother. And there was a disconnect with an ability to understand that. Um, and in considering this idea of intersecting identities, I think that uh, more and more 
I think we are beginning to talk more about how we are all, regardless of <laughs> how you perceive yourself, we all have these intersecting identities. But for those of us who maybe have um, certain identifiers that uh, we might wear on our faces, we are forced into these sort of roles that people want us to play. And um, the, to me, this idea of intersecting identities, I always fight between that space of saying who I am and performing who I'm told to be. Um, and one of the living in Canada, one of the benefits that I have is that I have a white passing voice. So whenever I'm on the phone, I'm a white passing person. You know, you can't tell uh, that I might not be white. So that affords me a lot of benefits when I am speaking to people, when I'm talking to people. There's an assumption of a shared background. There's assumption of a shared experience. But it also means that when I enter into those spaces where I'm going into that white passing role, I have to leave a piece of me, a piece of that identity. I have to pull that intersection out of me so that I can enter into that dominant cultural space. And there is that tension that happens. And just going back to EB again, what you're saying, that constant adjustment that we have to make with each inter uh, with, with each interaction, it, it can be difficult. Um, and, you know, this is going into my, my little bonus piece of within the United Church of Canada. I think one of the benefits I have with my role in working with our Seeds of Hope granting program at the foundation is I get to talk to so many different people who are uh, telling me about their wonderful programs and projects that are going on. But whenever I talk to someone who's coming from an ethnic church or you know a racialized space, there's always, well, I'm from the Filipino church or I'm from the Chinese church or I'm from the Korean church or I'm from the black church. There's always an indicator of where that person comes from. Um, and I just, I find those conversations are very different and have to start with, you need to understand my identity before you can understand my project. And I, I feel like there is that uh, common space of feeling like that invalidation that Hannah talked about and that constant adjustment that Evie talked about, as well as that in-betweenness of part of the church, but still not quite there that we need you're talking about. And I think that those this space here is wonderful to hear from some of the positive experiences we've had with the church and some of the breaths of fresh air that I think the United Church of Canada can offer us in some spaces, as well as challenge um, us here in the United Church of ways that we can continue to develop ourselves and develop uh, better practices to understand that we need to come to the table with an understanding of these intersecting identities that we are all um, <laughs> wanting to, <laughs> to be able to see and be heard with so that we can come as full full people here to the table. So thank you all. That Those were wonderful, wonderful uh, reflections on that question. I'm going to go back to share my screen and we'll, let's move on to our second question here. So as we continue to, to discuss and define intersecting identities, how would you define or describe how intersecting identities, oh, this is, sorry, <laughs> apologies, that was the question we just looked at. Okay, so our second question, here we go. What are some common misconceptions that you have experienced regarding what it means to be part of the Asian diaspora? And how have intersectional identities, whether or not it's your own or others that you might be encountering, um, shaped these misconceptions? And then that little bonus, have you ever encountered any of these misconceptions within United Church spaces? So Hannah, I think we can, we'll start with you. And I know you were talking a little bit about that connection to the diaspora. So I'm eager to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Um, my piece is a bit short for this question, but because I, I know in, for many racialized communities and not only the Asian diaspora, um, the idea of being a monolith is a common misconception. The assumptions that people carry um, about you that invalidate the varying and diverse ex perspectives that we've shared in this space together um, and many, many more that are not in this space. And so kind of putting that pin there um, for my own experience and one that I feel has been common in the church uh, in both uh, predominantly white 
Western Anglo churches and in Korean church spaces that are in Canada that I've um, that I've encountered is that the idea of being mixed race or biracial and that identities has been sometimes fetishized by people or idealized, especially in Canada, where we consider ourselves to be a multicultural country, multicultural nation, that my existence as a mixed race person is this beautiful multicultural phenomenon or an example of that. Um, and so I think seeing this is sometimes a, a misconception that seeing my existence as a an ideal can be validating or welcoming, where in reality, and some of the pieces that I shared in the previous question, it's a very messy experience and very, um, there's a lot of insecurities and layers to it that are more than just this beauty of being a bridge between two seemingly opposing um, cultures. Um, and so that's uh, the one piece that I wanted to bring uh, to this question. Thank you, Hannah. And the way really appreciate that idea um, of calling for that idea of the monolith and that expectation of um, you succeed because of your existence. That's such a, a potent way to think about that. Thank you. Um, Wingy, let's uh, move back to you. Sure, yeah. Um, I think one common misconception surrounding the Asian diaspora is the perception that regards Asians as perpetual outsiders or foreigners regardless of their birthplace or upbringing in a particular country. This misconception can lead to feelings of exclusion and being seen as other. When I was planning to pursue my doctoral studies in North America, one time I was seeking advice from a professor. At the end of our conversation, she made an odd remark that just stuck with me. She said, I hope you will find the education here helpful when you go back to your place next year. With that statement, the meeting adroitly ended. On my way home, I couldn't help but question if it was my English proficiency or the noise in the cafe that had hindered our communication. I also wonder if her response was a subtle indication that she doubted my abilities for further study. The uncertainty surrounding her response weighed heavily on me. It was not until I learned more about white supremacy and racism that I started to realize that, regardless of the professor's intentions, my discomfort stemmed from their gazing at me as an outsider, both geographically and academically. Essentially, I was made to feel like I didn't belong like a perpetual foreigner who would always be seen as someone who would necessarily return to their home country. Because this land would never truly embrace someone who looks like me. This realization helped me understand the broader context of the interaction. It reminded me that perceiving individuals as outsiders based solely on their racial or ethnic background is a result of a limited understanding of identity. Intersectionality teaches that our identities are complex and interconnected. Asians within the diaspora also hold multiple intersecting identities beyond their race or ethnicity, just like what Hannah just shared with us. Thank you, Lingyi. Yeah. Um... I really appreciate that uh, calling for the importance of recognizing that those microaggressive comments that people make, those pieces that continually remind us that we are other and that we don't quite belong. Um, it's easy to think, oh, well, when someone says where you're from, they're just trying to be polite. It's just a question. But oftentimes those uh, microaggressions are what remind us, oh, I'm still not quite enough like you. Thank you. That is a good reminder of how important it is to consider um, language and how we uh, interact. EB. Anna, and thanks for Wing and uh, Anna's comments. And then this is really relate, uh, your comment also relate to my own uh, response to this question as well. Uh, uh, 
a lot of people know this, uh, many immigrants or Asian people coming to Canada and they simply ask them, you have to become a blank, uh, blank of paper and learn everything and renew, relearn and let go of everything because you're now in this, in this, uh, in this country. So you have to learn to be a Canadian. But this is actually, uh, you're simplifying in language to ask people to live their life, which is, this is quite dangerous when you're in, in introducing people to Canada. This is actually quite uh, misleading sometimes because you can't ask people to let go of their own identity. As, uh, the identity, as we say, this is an ongoing process and this is accumulating a lot of the uh, beauty and riches in, in uh, developing your identity. But uh, we, I heard that, personally heard that from some of the, my friends and they say, and because they never have the uh, uh, people from other nations or from other countries. So, but they are just showing their uh, hospitality and they're friendly and saying that we're going to help you to do everything we could help you to adapt, to become a real Canadian. Sounds good. So, and then I realized that's kind of heavy burden because I didn't know, and I have no idea. I didn't ask for it. And, uh, but I would just want to say this is that you can see the micromanaging in this part when you are coming to a new environment and the friends or people or even not friends, they wanted to give you a lot of opinion because they are true Canadian. They know the uh, uh -huh questions and those kind of Canadian uh, perspective. So uh, I'm, we really, I really uh, respect that because those, those are really important things as well. But there's something that also important to people who are sharing their life experience in Canada as well, which is uh, at some point that if you're not un understanding enough or not willing to understand to learn the difference from uh, the a uh, the immigrants or the people from outside the country. For me as an Asian indigenous, and I uh, I encounter something which is I always ob observe that what can I learn from my friends, from my people that are around me, and then. Uh, there's one thing that just recently happened to my kids. It happened to me as well, but uh, I'll show you the conversation. It's when, one time that uh, my daughter asked me, my friends told me that, why are you a little bit dark than the usual Asian? And then my kids asked me, does that sound okay to you? And I said, no, this doesn't sound okay. I thought that they were your friends. Cause, and she said, this is my friends. And I'm not feel offended, but I just feel something weird when she say this word. And, and I ask her, can you describe how you feel about it? And say, I think it's a little racist. And then and I talk to my daughter and I say, let's call him, call this micro racism. Micro racism. Because a lot of people are not paying attention. They actually uh, unintentionally unaware that they are doing uh, uh, racism to their friends or people or some people that they have encountered. They probably say, oh, you have a really good English and you don't have, even have the accent where did you learn it and how how long you've been here and they're assuming that you are uh maybe raised and born here or maybe you are have a good you know educational background or something but this is not the case because this is all based on the not enough understanding other people or uh, knowing the difference uh, learning the difference from other people so uh another case is uh it also happened to me and also happened to my kids as well because this kind of thing is not just not there not just happened once or twice they happen very often but we understand that people are uh, trying to figure it out or maybe they ask the question or maybe they get up to this situation they didn't know but when we knowing this is keep happening and we found out people are not uh, really pay attention they're actually hurting other people's feelings but as a friend, we understand, and sometimes we mention it, but sometimes they just forget about it. But there's one thing that I want to just share uh, to this question is uh, a lot of people notice that uh, uh, a lot of Asian or immigrant people, when they respond to the uh, uh, white people or uh, race and born can Canadian, and they say, oh, you, you people are very polite, very, very kind, very funny, and very humor, and uh, I, I believe a lot of people are very positive and very uh, uh, friendly, but you have to know a lot of people, they're showing their humor, for example, when my daughter's friends tell him that tell her that you have a darker skin and she just like, well, I can't help about it. I can't help. And people just laugh. Okay. 
So uh, she's in front of her friends, she kind of showing that her humor. But you got to know this is her helpless reactions. She has no answer to those questions. And friends, her friends, and she also, they laugh about it and then think gone. And next time it happened again to other circumstance. But you got to see not only the kids and also the adults can happen to this. Or even you have a really nice accent. It's different than the other uh, people when they talk, when they speak in English. And I just say that it's, so what do you think about it? And I said, I think you are pretty good in, in English. And I laughed. And that is actually not that I really admire or appreciate they say it because I really helpless. I don't know what to say because you are actually marking my English in front of me. So should I say thank you for marking my English level or, uh, but this is the reaction when people are facing those micro racism and being vulnerable and they want to resist. They want to react those discrimination experience. But instead of saying something or react, respond to them, they just laugh and show, show, showing their humor action. And I said, well, I can't help, help about it. My skin just dark as it is. So there's nothing I can do. So people will laugh, but uh, you got to know people, people who ask the question, they will forget about it. But people who answer that you ask, they remember them for a long time. So I just want to say that people used to misunderstood that my people are tend to be okay. They are really have, um, happy all the time and privileged to be being part of this uh, in these places. But a lot of time, people need to know that why are those people having the same reaction when I say their accents are good and when they when I say their skin are different and the, the fingers are look different? Why they are all smiling at us? Mm -hmm. You gotta know that's a thing. Okay. Yes. No. Evie, I really appreciate those stories. Um, it's it's that idea of labor and burden. So uh, it becomes the burden of you as the, the father, but also your children um, to be the educators of what uh, it means to have these differing identities and what it means to have darker skin or lighter skin or an accent or a different accent that you're not quite used to. And this labor... And this burden of the labor gets put on, um, uh, on on us as people who have these different identities. And it's certainly coming from, um, you know, I, I, I'm looking at the screen and we're all Asian, but we are all coming from very different contexts and very different experiences. And I keep thinking about that word, Hannah, that you use, the monolith. How is it that all of our experiences are supposed to emulate the same piece? Um, so when I think about this question of these common misconceptions of what it means to be part of the Asian diaspora, you know, I, I remember, so I uh, live in this really small town. It's in Uxbridge, but it's called Eudora. We have like a general store and a gas station. And the general store used to be owned by um, a white couple. And whenever I would walk into the, the general store, they would watch me and they would make me feel uncomfortable and they never said hello. And it's that kind of microaggression that you can't, like if you, if I went to some people, they would be like, oh yeah, that's, that's not okay. And other people would be like, oh, they're probably just uncomfortable. They just don't know you. It's fine. You should just ignore it. Um, but then a couple of years ago, the general store was bought by an Indian family. Um, and, you know, we, I've uh, gotten to know this family quite well. And whenever I go in, we chat and we talk about, you know, what it's like in our, you know, our perspective, warmer countries. And we talk about where our kids are at in, in their development and all this, these different pieces. And they have this one cashier and she's, she's also white. And there was one day where I noticed her just shrink. Um, and I could tell, oh, she's uncomfortable because the experiences that I'm sharing with this Indian woman are experiences that she has never encountered in this small white town. She doesn't know where she fits into this space now. And it was just one of those moments where I, I kind of realized I'm in this space of freedom to be able to bring my full identity to the table. And in this moment, for the first time, perhaps, this other woman, this white woman felt, oh, I don't belong in my own space anymore. And I think that those are some of those feelings that we all are navigating every day. And again, bringing forth that burden of labor of 
who is carrying these conversations. And when I think about, you know, how these pieces play out, I think there's this idea of tokenism. And I think there's a lot of fear with encountering these conversations from, uh, from white spaces. So it's too easy to say, okay, well, Jenna, you're a person of color, so I'm not even going to deal with the race stuff. This is all on you. But I think that what I'm hearing is in these conversations is we can't, how, how are we meant to be the ones to bring the conversations forward if those conversations aren't also coming forward from the majority spaces, from the white spaces? And I, you know, if we're trying to be forced into this monolith, then how can we bring forth those conversations in a way that will enact real change and really push towards um, anti-racist uh, practice? So I just want to thank you guys. That Those were great reflections and really, um, you know, sometimes hard to hear pieces, but but important to hear pieces. Uh, so we're going to go and move on to, this is going to be our last kind of uh, prepared question here. So if for all of you who are joining in on our conversation here, if you have other questions that you'd like to ask, please feel free to write them in the chat and uh, we'll take a look at those once we finish here. But our last question is what are some practical or concrete actions and mindsets that you believe individuals and institutions can adopt to develop a posture that supports and encourages um, Asian anti-racism? So can we give some related examples or where we've seen these actions and mindsets lead to positive anti-racist change? And so Evie, we're just gonna jump right back to you uh, and get your reflection on this piece here. My uh, response to this question would be very short because I've said a lot in the first two. So uh, I would say this, uh, the practical uh, actions on this for the mindset of the uh, understanding, uh, uh, understanding is to learn to understand people's needs and situations because uh, People always have different background and different uh, circumstance at any any time. But not only just the uh, Asian or immigrants, everyone can be in that position. So, uh, and uh, intersection intersecting identities is not a bad thing. I want to say and encourage the people out there that uh, it's actually a blessing because the more that you experience your life, if you're positively embracing your difference, then you actually can create an opportunity to be a really helpful to other people. And then you can become a blessing as a hand of God to serving other people in your place, in your decisions. And uh, finally, I want to use uh, one of my uh, tribes, Munun's uh, philosophy to encourage and share with you about uh, our uh, our goal in our life. Because uh, in our in one of our philosophy is in, in the Munun tribe, we human is one of the beings in the creations. So our goal is to be part of the harmony in the creation instead of becoming a center or dominating others. So that's, we have been taught this for a thousand years in our tribe. We never wanted to be a boss, be one, be the controller. So that's why we speak to trees, we talk to animals and we sing songs to the rivers and mountains. And we are uh, asking, uh, support and help from the clouds. And those kind of practice we've been doing for 100,000 years. So I want to share with this that we human being as actually, um, we consider as part of the harmony in the creations. So uh, when you see that, you found out that you have no uh, different than the others because everyone's are in the same blessing creation that God has created. And I just want to say, uh, express my gratitude to the United Church being in this uh, in this denomination in the church and it's a very it's inclusive and uh, it's very welcoming environments and uh, knowing this the I can see the harmony in the United Church not only through the conversation or action but I can sense the spiritual spirituality uh, the movement dynamics uh, flowing in any any aspect any conversation or any situation. So uh, that's my blessing to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Evie. Thank you for that blessing. And thank you for that reminder of um, that we're here to be the harmony. Um, I think in the West, we have such a, a focus on power and maintaining power and holding power. And even going back to your previous 
uh, reflection on we're told to be a blank piece of paper and soak up and become a real Canadian, you know, that idea of this is the end goal. Um, but to take a step back and to realize that we are all the same, we all have intersecting identities and to embrace that as a piece of um, a positive part of life, as the positive part of harmony. That's, that's a wonderful reminder. Thank you. Okay, uh, Hannah, let's hear from you. Thank you, Evie, for your blessing. Um, I think my the first point or first kind of practical suggestion or action is very tied to much of what um, Evie has mentioned with his children, and that is to not be afraid to talk to young people um, about racism. Uh, and one of the biggest impacts for myself in in my journey of discovery and understanding my intersecting identities at a young age was a uh, younger age <laughs> was that I had adults that I could talk to and many of them are not people of color um so that that would be a, a really key piece if anything to take away is is having that openness and that curiosity and um the courage to talk to young people um which leads me to my second point in kind of the broader level of your community and, and where you are locally uh, is involving yourself or, or being aware of the organizations or institutions that give young people a community to talk about these things and to have relationships with role models and with um, uh, intergenerational relationships. Um, so, that could be the library, a local library, that could be a school, that could even be in the church um, if there are um, young people or youth groups. Um, but it can also be online as well. Um, a lot of the adults that I continue to uh, to stay in touch with traveling from Saskatoon to Toronto, um, a lot of that has been happening online where kind of sending resources to each other or um, like, hey, I thought this book would interest you. And if it was on a topic of um, Asian identity. And so those kinds of points of connection of, of seeing also the local communities and how you can, how you can help foster those relationship building um, moments, as well as maintaining those relationships that you have individually. Um, I think that it's um it's magical and transformative what representation and relationship can do um to heal and to move forward uh towards justice so those would be my pieces thank you hannah yeah i uh it, especially in these days where there's so much discourse around what is or is not appropriate to talk to kids about i think one of the things i'm hearing here from hannah you as uh, our youngest panel member as well as uh, Evie, who's talked about you know, having to talk to his young, young children. And um, I know in my life as well, just this idea of the education can't start early enough. We have to be able to have these conversations, both to prepare um, for difficult conversations that uh, some of our, our youngest um, might need to encounter. But also, like you say, Hannah, to have that hope and growth of uh, representations so that we're all able to be able to see ourselves reflected in the spaces around us. Thank you. Wingy, I'd love to hear your reflection. Thank you. Um, so I think there are two daily practices that we can incorporate into our lives. First, um, very similar to what we just shared, I think we need to be aware of the existence of microaggressions in our daily life. Microaggressions are not direct acts of harassment but rather subtle and in the various forms of intentional or unintentional actions or comments. For example, one common uh, microaggression experienced by Asians is being made to feel not good enough. Asian individuals are often seen as model immigrants who strive to adapt and obediently follow societal norms. When someone constantly reminds you that your accent, appearance, or gender make you inadequate or indirectly suggest that your expertise is less valuable because of who you are or where you're from. 
it can become a form of microaggression. These comments can be particularly harmful when they come from someone in a position of power, such as a head pastor commenting on an intern. All of these experiences can make individuals feel bad about themselves and questions their place within an organization. That is especially true for Asian women who are often stereotyped as quiet and submissive. So it is crucial for us to be aware of everyday microaggressions and strive to avoid perpetuating them. To avoid committing microaggressions it is important to focus not on ourselves, but rather an understanding who we are talking to and the context in which our words may impact them. Truly respecting all people is a way to fulfill the command of loving our neighbors as Jesus request. Second, we need to truly embrace our coexistence on this land. Recognizing the land we live on is a positive step. And I appreciate how UCC adopts that land acknowledgement in the order of service. However, it is not enough to simply acknowledge it intellectually. We need to internalize this acknowledgement and understand that no individual has the right to determine who is an outsider or a perpetual foreigner. It is essential especially essential for white people to develop an awareness that they are not the original owners of this land. The reality is that we are all sharing and coexisting on this land. No one person can claim the authority to determine who belongs or who should return to their previous space. This awareness should not only remain an external performance, but it needs to also be internalized into part of our identities. So by addressing microaggressions in our daily lives and embracing the coexistence of all individuals on this land, we may recognize the impact of intersectionality and challenging misconceptions. We can then foster a more inclusive and accurate understanding of the Asian diaspora. It is through this collective effort that we can break barriers and foster a more inclusive and accepting environment for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I really appreciate those uh, pieces of daily practice that we can bring forward. So it's not one thing that you can just do once and check off, but they are things we need to reflect on. And just thinking about this idea of, uh, again, we've, we've come back to the topic of microaggressions or microracisms a few times in our conversation tonight. And I think one of the way, one thing that can happen um, is that we can become props in other people's stories uh, as we become that kind of model uh, minority or that model person to be able to speak into what these things are. But we aren't props. And so we can't be props whether or not it's through we've done your light acknowledgement, so now let's move on, or any of those other pieces. Uh, we are full people that want to be able to participate fully um, and bring all parts of our identities to the table. Um, and when I think about these practical ways to address, you know, Asian anti-racism as well as moving towards anti-racism in general, I think one of the biggest things that I think of is the idea of making space, but making intentional space, not tokenizing space, not space that says, oh, well, we have one uh, Asian member on our panel and one Black member on our panel, so we're all good, but making intentional space for the multiplicity of voices and the multiple identities that we have so that we can hear from these perspectives again and again and again. Um, it's not just one and done. Again, it's that daily practice. It's that continued practice. Um, and sometimes when I uh, have seen people make space, it's again that, oh, well, I can't talk about this. So I'm gonna bring someone else who can not talk about this. But making space isn't just calling someone into a panel. It's not just calling someone into a position so that their face can be representative. Making space means really creating a uh, uh, place where um, they can take 
those people and those experiences and those identities that we're trying to uh, see and have represented represented can take full ownership and can say, this is who I am. And this is why my perspective might be this way. This is why people like me may also feel the same way. Um, and to be able to bring that again into other practices, into other places that we talk about these things um, and to continually reassess, okay, from different perspectives, why are we doing this? So one one way that I've seen, um, it's, a, it's a small thing, but you know, if you're gonna talk about we're here talking about uh, Asian identity. So if you're going to talk about Asianness, or if you're going to make a post for, you know, it's it's June, so you're going to make a post for uh, Asian and Pan uh, and Pacific Month. Reach out to those in your community who are from those identity spaces and say, "Hey, how do you think this reads? Does this look good? Does this look bad?" Because I've seen it where people have pushed out communications; and they haven't done the work to talk with the people around them and it's not hit the mark and the the communications or what, what we're trying to say just don't work out well. And I've seen it where it works really well because that extra step of daily practice of saying, no, we need to bring people, we need to make that space um, has really helped to uh, bring forth that representation uh, that Hannah was talking about. So that's the end of our um, kind of main questions here. Um, so I know that I do see at least one question in the chat here that I'll that we'll get to in a minute. And if anyone else here has um, any questions, please again, feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll get to them and we'll continue on the conversation for a few more minutes here. But Donald Brown asked, what should people say to begin a relationship of understanding the people of different cultures I usually start with, I love your accent, as I find accents beautiful. What should I say and how do we even begin that conversation? I think that's a really good question because I think, again, uh, Evie, you were talking about Canadians coming from this happy, joyful, funny stance, but sometimes those uh, interactions can can mask uh, some of the feelings that we may be feeling. Um, Hannah, I don't mean you are Evie doing Evie. Evie, I see you've un I muted, so I'll yeah. pass the pass Yeah, I'd like to answer the question. Thank you, uh, Donald. Uh, this is a really typical question that I've been asked many hundred times in the past. And uh, until a uh, certain time, the people never asked me the question. They asked me, instead of asking my English, what did I learn with, how did I do this? And they asked me, let's go for hockey game. So we're going to, uh, from because uh, when people are asking the question because they wanted to uh, build the relationship with you, they want to become your friends, and we know they have a good intention, but you would know when, when people have not, doesn't have good intention, you would soon, soon find out they are not here for uh, being a friend. And, but for people who want to make friends, uh, people will sense that you are humbling yourself and you wanted to get to know them, so get to know more about them. and. Uh, my friends, uh, when I was studying in uh, seminary and a lot of students and teachers, they when they first come to me and then they say this, Ibi, do you know there's a hockey in Canada? And I say, I heard about it. And I say, I have an extra ticket. Want to go? And I say, uh, sure, let's go. So then he introduced the culture, the hockey culture and Canadian things. And we, we went to there and he showed me everything. And he never asked my English or uh, my accent, and then gradually, and then I began to have trusting. There's a there's a trust in the relationship. So whenever he say in after that after that uh, we're bounding together the friendships already, and he is now officially have uh, built up a relationship as a friends. Then you understand when people are asking you some hard or question, and they are have a good intention uh, for you. Because uh, when 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 friends are truly friends, they tell the truth and they be honest with you. And they say, Ibi, your accent are stuck. I can understand when you say this article. But I always say, okay, how should I say that? But this is a really good and helping. I mean, this is the part that's when uh, friends are helping friends. And it's never about the, uh, the Asians and accent anymore. But when you first... Come in, in come front to uh, friends or that you never met before. Try to introduce yourself and uh, 
help them to understand you or understand the em- environment but uh, I would say this uh, leave the English or accent later for later conversations because they're already very nervous about learning language when they first come to Canada and then you don't want to give them too much pressure and very stressed about the English and language so but that's my uh, uh, my experience uh, so uh, maybe some other can answer yeah yeah, yeah. So we in hand, if you have any comments, uh, let, uh, feel free to pipe in. But I also see another related um, question from Pauline. Um, what would be an appropriate response if someone tells me that they love my accent, especially when I think the comment has racist connotations? That's such an interest. Like that's, I mean, it, it's one of those pieces, right, that we all live with. How do you respond to questions that make you feel uncomfortable? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if any of our panelists here have a response to that. Um, I think, you know, I think it sometimes I can be a little bit more uh, confrontational than maybe some people are comfortable with. But I think it's okay to say, you know, re- return that. Oh, you love my accent? I love your accent also. There are those reminders that because someone might think of themselves as being normal or the base, you know, this is base level, flipping that that question back to them and saying, oh, yeah, your accent is really lovely, too. Uh, Where does that come from? Even if it seems so obvious, I think that those are really important ways that we can take those questions and show them that we all have a way to answer them. Um, And it, you know... (laughs) It's kind of like that piece of where are you from? Where are you really from? You know what I mean. Where are you really, really from? And just being able to flip that as well. Oh, well, where are you really from? Oh, where are you really, really from? And I think that that's a way to, you know, again, bring back to that common um, experience that Evie was sharing, I think, uh, about we all have these pieces of our intersecting identities and calling that piece forth. Not sure if anyone else has anything to add. Maybe if I can respond a little bit, I have those conversations in the past asking me, "Where are you really from? You don't look like Taiwanese. You don't look like Chinese. You don't look like uh, Thailand." And and I say, "I'm Taiwan indigenous." You know, and uh, I try to share more experience and more knowledge or information about my background. But uh, sometimes some people they are not up to that. They just want to figure out where are you from, and uh, that's it. So then. They feel content and they just walk away. Some people, they just not here to be your friends. And like, they're here to wanted to, uh, some people wanted to tell you uh, something. And if you are really uh, uh, into that conversation, you might into a trap. Some people might want to know, okay, where are you from? And how did you get here? And uh, what is your purpose in when, at, at the first, first place? But I found that that's very, uh, uh, very not friendly in the conversation. So usually I just, in when I was younger, I just laughed. I mean, this sense of humor. And I say, oh, you are so funny. I don't really know how to answer you. And then I walk away. And uh, because this is not a not a proper conversation I would like to have, have. So you don't have to take this on your shoulder when you encounter those kind of people are not understanding uh, your situation, not knowing you, but they pretend to know that you need us, you need to get help or you need to hear something from them. But this is the conversation that I always say, if I if I talk to talk to me, talk to uh, 10, year, 10 years younger of me, and I'll tell them just, Ibi, just walk away. You don't need those conversations because they're going to discourage you, even though they didn't aware. But when you go home, you would think about them. Why did that man say that my English needs improvement? And why they, but they're not even my friends. They're just, you know, passengers that I was, uh, sitting together and on the bus or people are just happen uh, having a conversation in a restaurant in a McDonald's restaurant and they're just asking from a curiosity but sometimes they did not pay attention maybe they're not un- un- they are unaware they are saying those things might be uh, hurting others people feeling hurting them I don't after the conversation but and I would say that when people are asking you from the bottom part as a friend they give you a very comfort space as Jenna said that's there is a space already created for you. So when people asking the certain questions or some certain content, you feel uh, safe 
and you feel uh, okay to respond to them and you feel supported. So, and it actually depends on the different situations. So friendship and trust in between is really important. Um, and uh, yeah, can, can I respond to a bit about Pauline's question, uh, attitude of your uh, response? So from Pauline's question, um, I think it is a situation um, when we feel like we, we, we wonder if we experience a kind of microaggression. Um, the lie itself sounds very neutral. It, yeah, just like what we just shared, quite depends on how you speak it your gesture and our relationship between the speaker and the recipient, right? Uh, but at the same time, the person who received, uh, received a comment feels like, oh, we start to, to, to keep thinking, uh, is there something wrong there? Um, and what we can do to a situation like this, right? I, I, I think the question is asking about the, the acts that we can respond to a different kind of microaggression. Um, and the question reminds me of a, um, a an example from my friend, what she did when she faced a situation like this. So let me share briefly of, uh, of her story with you all. Um, then maybe we can think of what we can do to respond to that. So um, I have a friend, um, she's also a graduate student. And in one of her classes, the professor referred to her and an other Asian women student as young lady. Meanwhile, calling other non-Asian students by their preferred names. So the first step my friend did is to try to correct her professor multiple times on how her actual name can be pronounced, but nothing changed. Soon then, she started questioning whether this was a form of microaggression or if she was overreacting. Eventually, she decided to share her thoughts with other students who may have similar experiences in the class. And after confirming the shared struggles they had, she made the brave choice to report the situation to the school. Although her action may seem small, I believe that it sets a great example of how we can resist daily racism by briefly sharing our own stories with our companions. For example, like a group like this, we share our struggles, our suspects, and also share it with institutions that could carry our further actions. We are allowing our voices to be heard and we are resisting the status quo that is harmful to certain groups of people. It is speaking up for ourselves and at the same time, it's also allowing others to reflect on their positionality in initiating our or sustaining the violence with the words they use or the silence they choose to keep. So I think the action of sharing stories of microaggression is contributing to creating a more racially inclusive environment within our community. I hope it can respond part of Pauline's question. <laughs> Thank you, Wingy. Yeah, I I think sometimes we're, we're forced to speak much louder than maybe some of our peers when we're encountered with these microaggressions, which can be, again, that unfair burden, but that that piece of action that sometimes is necessary. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, to, to report that, I think a lot of people would see that as being an overreaction to something that's not that big of a deal. You should just forget about it. But not realizing that that's not one example that happened once. That's something that is happening every day through multiple moments, through multiple places. And that is just one space where um, she was able to uh, create a space of change and use her voice to, to hopefully enact change. Okay, thank you. That was a wonderful story and a good reminder. And thank you, Pauline, for uh, your comment that, that this is helpful. Um, so I'm just going to call out one more time if anyone has any questions to pop them in the chat. Um, we're nearing the end of our time here, but before we close, I just, I am relatively new to the United Church. And so one of the things that I've been thinking throughout uh, this evening is, what's my experience as, a, you know, a, a person of Asian heritage 
um, within the United Church compared to my experience as a person with Asian heritage and, you know, of course, all the other intersecting identities, I think, as well, um, with the non-United Church. I will uh, leave it with that without getting too much more specific. And I think for me, while there is always going to be more work to be done um, as we seek to become an anti racist denomination um, and as we seek uh, anti-racism in all of the different spaces that we encounter um, is that the conversations are happening and um, you know so uh, uh, Adele I want to thank you again for uh, arranging not just this evening but also for uh, continuing um, on these 40 days of anti-racism year over year that I can only imagine the uh, emotional toll it takes on you to uh, bring together all these stories and all of these experiences and to hear all of these different pieces. Um, but I think for me that this is, you know, one of those experiences that I've had within the United Church that helps me to see uh, that piece of action. So again, not just saying in practice we'll do these things, but here's an actual action. And for all of you that are joining in with us tonight, I mean, I'm so encouraged. I can say from my, uh, you know, 15 or so years of experience working in other uh, denominations, if I had organized an event like this, I don't think that I would have even a quarter of um, the uh, attendance that we've had this evening. So I just want to thank all of you here tonight as well um, for joining us in this conversation, to listening to our stories and to uh, for uh, considering, you know, these perspectives maybe that are part of yourself or outside of yourself or intersecting with your identities as well. So uh, thank you, Adele. Thank you, um, all of you who are attending. And of course, thank you, Wingy, Evie, and Anna. Sorry. We have one more quick question here. Uh, what is an opening sentence then if you are waiting in a doctor's office, for example, if you just want to begin knowing something? So I will open it up, but I just think sometimes it's not about, you know, the things you see on someone's face. It would be the same opening sentence that you would give to anyone else um, if they didn't happen to be someone of a different race or a different ethnicity would be my consideration. So what do you do for work is one, or do you have kids? Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has uh, anything else um, that they'd like to add to that. Um, I... I'm thinking with that question of experiences that my friends have had um, interacting with with people who who want to get to know them, and sometimes there is a little bit of a like a uh, different social norms in terms of how to start conversations, and so sometimes I think one important thing to note is, um, like Jenna said, definitely opening as you would to anyone who you'd like to get to know. Um, but if that isn't received in the way that you were expecting or that that doesn't open a conversation or that you offer or invite someone to speak uh, or to um, start a conversation and it's not received the way that you were expecting and it doesn't go anywhere, um, not being discouraged by that or um, projecting onto them because it could be um, for many different factors, just the space that you're in, the environment at the time that you are not um, getting that relationship that you were or building that relationship that you were expecting to. Um, so I think having that, that reminder or coming with that awareness um, of, of you as a person and what kind of uh, how your appearance kind of can be in a space and, and kind of ch change the interaction that you have. Um, so I hope that that helps. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, Evie? Yeah, Final I just word? want to share a little bit. Sorry? No, just go on. Okay, I just want to share a little bit my own habits. I have three-second policy on my own life because uh, I don't usually talk to people in a clinic or in a hospital unless I am at doing the visitation or I have some uh, agenda to work. But... Uh, if I'm in a random street, on a random street or in a, in a store, I have a policy in myself. If th a person look at me three seconds, I'll talk to them. That's mean you're giving me uh, our permission to uh, connect with you. 
because uh, and that's based on some uh, uh, some studies. And when people interest you, they stare, uh, not stare, look at you for a few seconds. And that's your really good opportunity to maybe uh, make a new friends and have a conversation. And I always start with the weather. Canadian really like talk about weather. And uh, because the weather here is so beautiful. And uh, uh, I that works every time. I talk to the uh, homeless people, talk to the policeman, talk to the doctor. Whoever look at me three seconds, I talk to you and I say, hi, sir, how are you doing? And, uh, and they were just like, okay. And the person talking to me. And they when they open the conversation, they actually, they probably didn't intense, uh, intend to talk to you. But when you respond to their, uh, their, their, their gesture, look at you and they feel, they will feel like, oh, you also open to them. So then they actually create a harmony space and in, in building a relationship. And that's, I, that's how I found many friends and uh, a good good people around my community. Because a lot of people really are really, really kind and really uh, nice around uh, in, in, your, in your community. So that would be a good opportunity. I'm just sharing this. With you. Thank you. Okay, so I think that we're gonna uh, come to an end here now. Um, before we close, I just, on our screen here, you'll see a contact, so at-racism at united-church.ca. If you have any other questions or if you have any other comments or feedback, feel free to reach out to that email there. If you wanna reach out to the panelists, you can also send an email to that, uh, a, a message to that email and they'll make sure it gets to us. Um, and one more note of housekeeping. Um, when you when we close tonight and when you click that leave button to exit out of um, our session this evening, you're going to uh, have an opportunity to take a survey, which is going to be we really appreciate if you could fill that out and take a couple of um, a minute or two to give us some feedback on um, the session and all the different pieces there as well. But just remember that that will come up after you click the leave button. Um, and just as we close here, sorry, give me one minute here. Um, I just want to uh, close with a couple of lines from our uh, song of faith that we have at the United Church of Canada. It's the opening words that I just, I thought uh, fit well for this evening. God is holy mystery beyond complete knowledge, above perfect description. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our panelists for joining us and sharing with us this evening. And I hope you all have a great evening, uh, rest of your evenings as well. Thank you.